I think you know that the firm for over 15 years has been incredibly committed to our 10,000 small business program. We've uh, we've brought the program to over 14,000 small businesses across the country. And the history of the program and the way we rolled the program out over the last uh, the last 15 years is we went into cities around the country to really increase business education for small businesses. And as we're looking to expand further, one of the things we think is desperately needed is help for businesses in rural parts of the country where they don't have the same access to resources that they might have in some of the cities. And so back in 19, uh, back in 2021, Senator Kramer invited me out to North Carolina, uh, out to North Dakota, I'm sorry, North, North Dakota. And we had a good meeting out here where we spent some time talking about small businesses here. We were thinking a lot about what we could do more broadly to expand our 10,000 small business program. And we really saw that there was a real need. You know, when you when you look broadly across the country and you look at a state like North Dakota and also Arkansas, which is the second state we're rolling this additional program out to that we announced today, 99% of all the businesses in these states are small businesses. You know, it's pretty consistent across the country that small businesses drive a lot of the jobs in the United States. 42% of all employment in the United States comes from companies that employ less than 50 people. And so as we wanted to expand 10,000 small businesses, we thought we should develop a program that could really support it in rural communities. We decided to start with North Dakota and Arkansas, but we certainly have plans to roll it out to other states shortly, including South Dakota and other states in the Midwest that we're targeting. We've done a bunch of research. We've had about 75 meetings to look at where we think there's need. And we're excited that this $100 million commitment today, which 75 million goes to fund CDFIs, 15 million to fund the community colleges that support the educational effort and 10 million to make capital more accessible. Um, we think this is a good start to expand the program rurally and that 75 million of grants to CDFIs brings our total commitment to CDFIs through this program up to $1.6 billion. So we think this can continue to have a broader impact on small businesses across the country. That generates obviously economic growth and we think it's very important for the economic ecosystem of the United States. I talked to your uh, chief economist, Jan Hatzius, at, at the tech conference. Now, he lowered this week his recession odds from, I think, believe it was from 20 percent to 15 percent, so a little bit better there. But when you talk to small businesses, are they still worried about a recession? And how, you know, what's the economic vibe from that small business customer? Sure. So Jan did lower his, uh, his economic prediction for recession. There's no question the U.S. economy has been a lot more resilient over the last 12 months than we would have expected. And I think the chance for a softer landing uh, right now is much higher than we would have anticipated a year ago. That said, small businesses feel the brunt of inflation, higher interest, interest rates much more directly than large organizations. They don't have the flexibility or the nimbleness or the resources to necessarily brave those headwinds so quickly. I think we all know that the pandemic was devastating to small businesses across the United States. A lot of them are service businesses that definitely lost their ability to serve customers during the pandemic. Uh, they had to save more aggressively to keep their businesses growing. And so small businesses have definitely had a bumpy ride over the course of the last few years. Um, there's no question as the economy has done better, they are experiencing this, this, this softer landing environment, but they definitely have more headwinds than the larger enterprises across the country. If the economy has hit that soft landing uh, position, David, what is your outlook for that that bread and butter uh, investment banking business over the next six months? Of course, a lot of excitement around the arm deal, Instacart, you name it. So we're starting to see some big names in that private market come to public market or at least very soon. Do you see that IPO market and the investment banking business starting to turn around? Well, we've been through a really tough year for capital markets activity. We went from a very robust environment in 2021 it's obviously a much different environment after the war in Ukraine started. And obviously, you know, very, very high rampant inflation, a much, a very significant change in posture from the Federal Reserve. If you go back and look at Powell's comments, you know, a year ago at Jackson Hole, that decreased confidence significantly. And of course, that closed down MA activity and capital markets activity. And that activity really in the first half of this year was pretty anemic. We are starting to see a pickup in activity. As you mentioned, there are some very significant IPOs that are in the market this week. Uh, the ARM IPO is progressing nicely. And I do believe that if these IPOs 
go well, that kind of creates a virtuous cycle of bringing some of the other IPOs that are in the wings waiting to market. And so I do see a pickup in capital markets activity during the course of the fall. I can't say that we'll get back to what normalized levels are, but we're really coming off of, you know, zero activity. And so we're encouraged by what we see. And obviously an environment with more capital markets activity uh, is a good environment for Goldman Sachs, given our position in those businesses. You know, this pickup in uh, investment banking, good to see. I mean, it's long overdue, but it comes at a time with increased tensions between the U.S. and China. And I hope I got this right. I think Goldman opened its first office in China in 1994. I think I, I hope I did the Yahoo search right. Uh, apologies if I did not. Nonetheless, you do do business in China. You know, how concerned are you about the, these increasingly frayed tensions between these two big economic superpowers? Well, there's no question that the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and China is something that's getting an awful lot of focus. I thought Secretary Raimondo did a terrific job uh, in her visit, delivering some very, very important messages. We're significantly intertwined uh, with China economically, uh, yet from a strategic perspective and a security perspective, uh, we have some very, very important things that we need to move forward to rebalance some of the relationship that we have with China. That obviously, that tension and some of those issues as we work through them, those are headwinds to growth. China's economy at the moment definitely seems softer. That's something that that we're, we're attached to. If China catches a cold economically, we're probably going to feel some headwinds to economic activity because of that. Uh, so this is something that we all have to watch very closely. Uh, but I'm pleased you know, with what I see in the dialogue. But this is going to take some time to sort out. One year ago, I think it was about one year ago, we, we were talking about the, your latest 10,000 small businesses. I think it was a DC event. Now, fast forward to today, Goldman's a different business. You know, you've pulled back uh, in the consumer area that more mass market is. Are you totally done in mass market? Do you ever see yourself maybe making a, a return there at some point once you've you know, make it, made some of these exits more recently? Well, we, we built a very significant deposit platform in Marcus, um, and we continue to be in that business. We'll continue to take deposits. Uh, from uh, from the mass market, our Marcus platform has over 100 billion dollars, 130 billion dollars of a government guaranteed digital deposits. We pay a very very attractive rate, I think, to depositors in that platform. Uh, we still operate our credit card platforms, but we have scaled back uh, some of our ambitions to be a larger direct to consumer platform, and we're really focused on our two principal businesses: our leading investment banking and markets business, which is about 70 percent of the firm, and our broad global asset and wealth management business where we supervise $2.7 trillion of assets and are the fifth largest active asset manager in the world. We see an enormous growth opportunity for the firm in that area, and we're very focused on it. So that's where the lion's share of the firm's focus is at this point in time. Would there ever be any interest in, in acquiring a, a smaller, you know, getting into the, the community banking? If those acquisitions came up, you know, certainly a lot of opportunities presented themselves earlier in the year. Is that something that would interest you as a way to more quickly get back into that space? Where our, our, our focus, our strategy is, is clear. We articulated in our investor day uh, in, in early February. We are focused on our investment banking and markets business, our primary muscle group. We have a leading franchise and the growth of our asset and wealth management business. There'll be other things that we touch on, but those are our primary focus at the moment. We have, we have no, no, no plans to make an acquisition of a, of a community bank or a banking institution at this point. Fair enough. You know, and, and David, there's been a lot of just... Um... I mean, you saw this coming. There's been a lot of just strange stories about Goldman Sachs. And I think Yahoo Finance, that our community doesn't really care about any of this stuff. They want to know how your stock is going to do, how your financials are going to perform. But you as a leader, you know, as you look back over the next past few months, you know, how have you changed? Do you see a better path to just sentiment on your leadership and, and the culture inside of Goldman Sachs? Well, I wake up every day focused on Goldman Sachs. And I wake up every day thinking about with my management team, my broad management team, and I'm very fortunate to work with an extraordinary management team across our management committee. I'm very focused on how we serve our clients, serve them with excellence, serve them with distinction, and how also we deliver for shareholders. Uh, we're coming up on, on five years this month, and if you look at this leadership team and the work we've done over the last five years, we've performed for our clients, we've grown our business, we've performed for shareholders. That's what our focus is on, and you know we tend to stay focused on those things. That's the discussion inside Goldman Sachs. When you when you sit with investors and you sit with, with clients and you look them in the eye, do you do they still have confidence in a Goldman Sachs? I think our clients have enormous confidence in Goldman Sachs. The feedback from our clients around Goldman Sachs and the work we do for them continues to be very, very strong. We wake up every day dedicated to serving our clients. I think we do it with excellence. We do it with distinction because the extraordinary people that Goldman Sachs has all over the world. 
And so we feel very, very good about our client franchise, but we don't take it for granted. We invest in it every day. And I'm very confident that if we continue to serve our clients with distinction, Goldman Sachs will continue to grow and will continue to thrive just as it has for the last 150 years.